Okay, we're going to switch to case two. Uh, we're going to talk about Chip, who is a 29-year-old male. He um, has established psoriatic arthritis about three years ago. He's been on uh, an anti-TNF, which has really helped his skin. Um, not so much as peripheral arthritis or enthesitis. He complains mostly about pain in his feet, but he's a construction worker, and so he thought maybe he was overdoing it a little. Um, vital signs um, were normal. Um, just to give you a little bit about his history, he's had psoriasis since he was in his 20s, but his joint symptoms really um, came later. Um, he was on adalimumab, which controlled it, as I said, um, but he still has persistent Achilles tendonitis. Um, his nail beds are erythematous. He does have a smoking history, um, and he drinks on um, weekends um, with his buddies, and he does have a family history of um, CVD. So we've heard this data before. Um, from um, Chris and Phil that anti-TNF therapies have been successful um, in PSA. But at this point, I'd like to um, either turn it over to the audience to say, so would you consider him now a partial responder? Um, what are some of our options? Do you think um, he's just failing the TNF? Would you switch a mechanism of action? So I just want to hear some thoughts from the audience. and. Uh, Sort of, this is just a recap, a 29-year-old who's had established psoriatic arthritis with really good control the first couple years, and now um, some bothersome um, symptoms, nail beds, and uh, uh, Achilles tendonitis. Any thoughts? No right or wrong answer, just want to hear. Yes, so since he had a good response for a while, maybe just first making sure he's not making antibodies or neutralizing antibodies to um, adalimumab at this point versus progressive disease. Um, okay, at this so point. you might check some serum levels of antibodies? Before what, what does the this? panel think about that? We can't get it done. Which, which assay are you thinking about? Prometheus or um, if we can get it done. If not, then um, maybe adding a DMAR first to see if that would improve his condition if it's associated right. with uh, antibody. Sure. Not, any other so, thoughts so, about so antibodies? My, my comment on that is I think that's a wonderful aspirational um, approach. I'm not sure that I have as much faith in the those types of assays as the gastroenterologists do uh, in terms of giving true information. But the... Um, uh, we, we, we are seeing data from groups like Wolbinks in uh, the Netherlands that do suggest that uh, immunogenicity uh, to adalimumab may be higher than we think. Uh, however, um, whether or not adding methotrexate on at this point would have any benefit in that regard is questionable. Uh, and so um, it's, it's a tough situation. I, um, in, you know, for, I think the, there are a variety of options uh, uh, from my perspective. One would be um, trying to get insurance to approve weekly um, uh, adalimumab instead of ever, every other week uh, to try to over, overcome that potential immunogenicity or at least address it some. The other is the um, uh, switching uh, anti-TNFs in the third uh, in my mind, would be to switch to a, a different mechanism of action, including uh, an IL-17 inhibitor such as secukinumab. I would add a comment, which is that uh, Achilles enthesitis is one of the real problems that we see with these patients, especially if they are workers like this guy. Uh, and um, you can have complete control of disease but a single Achilles enthesitis can just uh, um, uh, uh, prevent a person from doing what they normally would be doing, and they have to wear a boot and blah, blah, blah. So I think this is a very important um, issue to address. Yeah, so this is a real case, and you brought up those good points. Dr. Weissman? I think a point should be made and should have been made yesterday when this was discussed about what defines a partial responder. Uh, and let's go back in history a little bit. A partial responder depends upon what other drugs are available. And that's been true from the beginning of time. So if there was nothing else available, another mechanism of action, you'd push this drug or shorten the interval or whatever. 
It's, tr it's true from the beginning of time. Uh, patients are generally conservative, though. They are afraid of losing efficacy when they change to another drug. And physicians are usually more aggressive in doing this. So I have to keep this in mind. So that's how I answer the question. So I think there is a pragmatic approach here, too. One could add uh, an anti-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. One could prescribe um, uh, insoles or th that would lift the heel a little bit so there's less pressure on the Achilles tendon before moving on to another drug. If there was no response or, or even partial response. Wonderful Canadian the, answer. <laughs> if there was no response in the other aspects of the disease, then there would be no question that you would be moving to either another medication in the same um, family or to another me mechanism of action. So I live close to the Canadian border, and I'm, I'm sort of agreeing with Daphne here. A um, couple of things. We've seen patients who we thought were psoriatic nails on anti-TNFs that were fungal. So important to have your dermatologist do a KOH or maybe even your own uh, office to do that. And um, I, I find that for treatment of Achilles tendonitis, great uh, uh, physical therapy and topical diclofenac are really very effective. So we would, in our combined clinic, we would not switch the anti-TNF in this patient. I agree with Lenny that, you know, I think drug levels are something we don't do enough in rheumatology. It's certainly widespread uh, use of that in gastroenterology and it's something to consider. Thank you. So just so you know, the panel hasn't seen these cases, so it's not exactly how, how I want it. So, so the other question that remains is, so what, what is in his exam and um, when does he meet something called minimal disease activity? So. Um, he actually doesn't have much cutaneous. It was taken care of by the adalimumab, didn't really come back other than the nails. He's got about three tender joints. He's got some um, enthesitis, um, perhaps some inflammatory back pain now. These are his patient reported outcomes you see below. And just as a quick question, um, what, uh, which of the following criteria um, do you, don't um, fit in the MDA, in the minimal disease activity? Go ahead. Okay, so a nice spread. So uh, we did hear a little bit about the uh, minimal disease activity, so um, we can uh, comment on, on that for Chip. Um, so here in red are some of the things that, uh, is this something you use, the panel, and how do you use it? So we, we certainly do use the MDA because I think of this as being easily used in the clinic as long as you ignore the, uh, not the PASI and just use body surface area. But there are several ways in which, uh, by the way, the answer to this uh, is that the, uh, there's not a physician global in the um, MDA. But the, uh, he was clearly not achieving MDA for several reasons, including uh, his patient global uh, and pain VAS scores, the fact that he had more than one uh, tender joint, and the fact that he um, had um, well, I suppose the was, he had the, once, so. yeah, I guess he fulfilled the MDA criteria of just, but I must admit, as I mentioned, uh, the Achilles tendon, especially in an, uh, a, a worker like this, is, is going to be a, a big problem. So I might give him, uh, say, a one plus on his enthesitis. <laughs> uh, and so he's, not clear, he's clearly not an MDA, and we would be pushing to yes. be a little bit more aggressive about treatment. So would anybody want to... Um, confirm at this time? I mean, we did, but just confirm imaging. I know we haven't really talked about that, but just another thought. Is his pain really from something that we know? Do you take his patient reported outcomes? Do you go on to more imaging? Any thoughts on? You know, if, it, if things don't work the way you expect them to work, you always want to find out, did you make the okay. right diagnosis? So it's not a bad idea to try and confirm that, although the correlations between the imaging and the physical exam are not always that high. So he was a little bit reluctant to kind of change. He had a really good response, and um, he thought maybe a lot of it was his own doing, and so he wanted some time um, to get through this. Um, these are just some slides to review what you heard this morning of applying a, um, the ULAR criteria or the GRAPA criteria um, to the case. Um, and we talked a little bit about that and um, just thought I'd just throw up some slides. I know we don't have a lot of time to go over some of the data that was already presented in terms of actually switching, adding um, additional DMARDs or going to another um, 
MOA. Um, so he was actually reluctant to go to another uh, mode of action. He had a, he just had such, remember such an exuberant response to Adalimumab. We did change him over to another uh, TNF. He hasn't been on any other TNF. Um, he uh, continued to experience um, symptoms, but he also continued smoking. Mm -hmm. And so we tried really hard, but this was um, difficult for him. He was around many people that smoked at work um, and despite counseling. Um, so his main issue was actually Achilles tendon, so after doing the imaging. And so um, the question is, um, which has a more favorable profile then um, for this um, patient? What does the data show? Okay, so we're kind of split between uh, switching MOAs or there's really no reliable data amongst. So I know we went over some of this, but I think this is a common clinical problem that we have and how confident are we telling our patients which drug really would be better for what his problems are right now. Um, and I'll throw it to the panel. How you so a couple comments I might make. I think that the whole uh, area of enthesitis assessment is one that interests us a lot and is in evolution. We have a number of indices, uh, such as the Leeds Enthesitis Index and SPARC or Maastricht uh, for clinical assessment, but as Daphne just mentioned, there's very poor correlation between what we're seeing clinically and what is being seen on ultrasound. Uh, and so I think that the, uh, we still don't have a, a final answer uh, in that regard. We, I showed you some very strong data uh, with uh, secukinumab, uh, with uh, complete, as well as ixekizumab, with complete resolution of um, uh, the of enthesitis. But remember that uh, the this is using some of the newest approaches, and we're really focusing on it more. Back in the days when the anti-TNFs were being developed, we didn't really, in fact, I can remember in designing the first Tannercept study, there were no measures. So we didn't even measure enthesitis response at that time. So I, th uh, I think uh, that uh, we're, at least with the biologics, we're showing good data. With the primalas, there is some positive data as well. So I think that uh, it's, it's mixed. I think all of the choices are still open to us. But yeah. the bottom line is that, uh, that there are no comparative data. So we don't have, we, first of all, we don't have a study that's designed specifically for enthesitis. In all the studies, this is a secondary, a secondary outcome. And we certainly don't have comparative, like uh, direct comparisons, except, by the way, secukinumab and adalimumab, where in the, in the um, I forget the name of the study, but anyways, in the, in the studies that, uh, that include secukinumab, they included, um, ad, uh, not ix, uh, ixekizumab, Ixekizumab, they included adalimumab. It was the spirit one The spirit study. one study included adalimumab as, um, as a comparator and actually confirmed that adalimumab works for enthesitis better than the original adalimumab study. Good, thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna have some fun. Can I get you guys to come here once a week and give you all my tough cases? This would be really helpful for me. <laughs> so the first page I'm gonna present is from Corey, New York, down, down south. It depends on what wine you serve, Chris. <laughs> What's that? It depends on what wine you serve. <laughs> Definitely I'm not from so Mosul. sure about, you, okay. you offered Lenny some Riesling. I'm not sure if he's gonna take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lenny likes Riesling, he does. So first patient is from Corny, New York, down south here, a patient I'm gonna to talk to you about. So this is um, Timothy, he's a 44-year-old uh, male, presents with neck and back pain as a second opinion. He's had um, 16 years of low back pain, which began at night and seemed to improve with movement and naproxen. Um, and then he had worsening neck pain and range of movement in neck over the next several years. Uh, three years earlier, um, he had lower quadrant pain and colonoscopy showed colitis and he was started on Pentassa. Uh, he had a repeat colonoscopy about oh, nine months later, which also showed inflammation, but the second gastroenterologist thought this was more related to NSAIDs than it was true Crohn's disease, and um, suggested he stop his non which he had been taking 
uh, consistently for many, many years. He did that. Um, but he then was referred to a rheumatologist. So he was referred to a rheumatologist about eight years after his symptoms started. So this is something we've been uh, hearing about in, in the literature for a long time, and this is a perfect example of that type of patient. Uh, he was started on azulfidine by the rheumatologist with no response, and he continued to really do poorly in terms of the range of motion in his neck and how he was functioning at work. And so he saw the rheumatologist in a follow-up visit uh, who recommended that he start adalimumab, um, and the gastroenterologist sort of seeing that he didn't get better off NSAIDs thought he should take 6-MP for his colitis. And the rheumatologist started on al allopurinol because he thought he might have gout in his big toe, but there was no confirmatory evidence in terms of aspiration. Chris, before you go on, I noticed that you've used the nonspecific term colitis. Uh, uh, he uh, was not obese at the time. I saw him hypertension factor 5 light, and and had, had repeated episodes of anterior uveitis. Uh, at the, and this was when I saw him four years ago. <laughs> I, I mention this because it's relevant. There's no his family history of psoriasis, a, uh, AS, Crohn's disease. He had a, uh, a or PSA. His brother committed suicide three years ago. He works as an administrator. He's married with quadru quadruplets age eight. Uh, wife is a stay-at-home mom who uh, homeschools the kids. A lot of stress in, at home and in the marriage and um, does not drink or smoke. So here's the uh, exam and lab data, um, and you can see that he has um, normal vital signs, uh, marked kyphosis of thoracic spine, and really moves as a unit. You've seen this before in your office with some patients. His neck motion really, his cervical spine was fused. And the only other important findings that we need to know here is that he had a Schober score of 12, uh, 12 chest expansion two. of 2 centimeters, okay. um, hips and shoulders showed normal range of motion. B27 negative, Michael, uh, but he had high acute facial reactions, which he had had all along, by the way, which is so disturbing um, for such a long time. So I'm going to get to you, you folks in a minute. <laughs> I'm coming. So here's his x-ray at presentation uh, to me, and this was read as normal. Can you believe it? Isn't that amazing? So you can see that there is uh, SI involvement, and Michael showed you beautiful pictures of this. And the other so thing that I, I like the, 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 uh, you folks to comment over there is it seems like there's a lot of remodeling going on in here as well that we often see well, well, with our Chris, patients. Chris, clearly the key thing for the radiologist is that there was no fracture. And so um, I, did, I have another view, Jack, I didn't bring it, but it's clear that right above that there's a lot of um, sclerosis on the iliac side and that side. But it's a good point, because it is open at the bottom there. You're absolutely correct, although not over here. Uh, Jack, you should stay at home and, you know, don't read the x-rays. It's a lot better for the rest of us. <laughs> but, Michael, would you agree that this is not a normal SI film? No, and what would you do to prove you'd get a Ferguson view, right? Yeah which is a 20 degree angle to the head view, right. so you can see the, the sacroiliac joints lined up pretty well, and you'd see, or if you're really worried, you'd get a CT, a limited CT, which would show exactly what this AP shows, is that there's sacroiliitis that's been there for a while. And his uh, cervical spine films, as you might expect, showed uh, fusion uh, along the lines of what we see with uh, syndes flowing syndesmophytes in his cervical spine. So you're throwing at us a case of a guy with uh, long-standing back pain, B27 negative, sacroiliitis, he's got melanoma, he might have MS. You're telling me he's got uh, This is real, I didn't make this so up. So this is a real life case, right? <laughs> I didn't make so it what up. did you do? Well, what would you do? You're the hey, expert. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> you can't pull the bag on me now. You're sitting over there. It's pretty easy. I. I <laughs> I get my GI guy to tell me, look, does this guy have active Crohn's or active colitis? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. And if, he, and if it's active colitis or Crohn's, I'm worried about that because that really shouldn't go untreated. Those people get strictures and whatever. They get bad things. You know, back pain's one thing. Crohn's is another. All right? So I, I check with the gastroenterologist and find out, is there active Crohn's or not? So, I call, so he lives down in Corning, he's about an hour, two and a half hours away. So I called each of his gastroenterologists and got totally <laughs> different answers to whether or not he had Crohn's disease. And I called his rheumatologist and got a third response. So, so then I talked to him, I said, well, we probably, exactly what you're saying, we probably need to know what's going on in your colon. So we were working on getting that schedule to get him up to have a, uh, a study. 
So we're here, diagnosis and treatment. So um, we, in the meantime, you know, this guy was suffering terribly. Could not take nonsteroidals because they thought it could be inducing his bowel problems. So what would you do before you, if before you had the answer to the colonoscopy? How would you treat this gentleman? He's pretty miserable. He's got four eight-year-olds at home, being homeschooled. Work is tough. He's an administrator. He's really, this guy is very miserable. Well, the cop-out is sulfasalazine. But he's already been on that. Right? He's been on that. He's been on that. Yeah. OK. Well, he's on Esacol. He was on. Uh, You're right. He was not on okay. Esacol. So he was not on Esacol. That's right? correct. He was on Esacol. All right. So that's it. But it really, the whole thing depends on his gut. All right? I want to know whether his gut's active or not or it's quiet, because I'm going to have to move to a biologic drug, and I've got to figure out which one to do, and is there safety, or is it IL-23, IL-17, or, or God forbid, another anti-TNF agent? So he did have a colonoscopy, and it showed areas of inflammation, spotty, but not consistent with Crohn's disease. <laughs> How about rituximum? Rituximab? Anybody else? Anybody like any shots? So this was, uh, this was in 2013 when the uh, Abatacept trial was going on in AS. Um, and so I took a, took a shot. I gave him IV Abatacept. Um, didn't work at all. Didn't help me in the least. So as we were going through that, I'm going to just go skip through this because the case is more, is more fun. Um, so abatacept IV did not work. What, what would you try now? Rituximab, any, anything else? Anybody got any ideas? Well, I, I think that if you could get it approved, ustekinumab would be a, an option here because yes, of again, the... Again, this was 2014, and... Um, I think uh, we, we had the, the data from the open-label trial. So that's that what I did. Yeah. Okay, so I went and battled the insurance company. It took me a very long time and gave him the phase two data and said, I don't have any other options, and we put him on ustekinumab, and right after we started it, this is what happened. He came in, and he was like walking like this. It was amazing. And he had a, a fracture of T10. I think you can see that. I mean, it was amazing when I, when I saw him in the office. He wasn't in any pain, interestingly. More pain. He's always in pain. And you can, I'm just showing you the degree of his kyphosis and also the fact that he's very osteopenic. Um, we had ordered a DEXA scan. He hadn't gotten it. We did get a DEXA scan, and he had a, a T-score of minus 2.5 in the spine. Um, what do you do now? This really happened. Well, I, I don't think there's any relationship between ustekinumab and this happening. I think. Oh, I don't think so. It was very soon. I don't think so. Right. And, I wasn't trying to and imply And one that. of the things that's been highlighted by um, uh, studies out of UCSF, uh, among other places, has been that um, uh, spinal fracture is one of the highest issues of morbidity and even potentially mortality. So. Um, I would certainly be wanting to use a um, osteoporosis drug uh, uh, such as Forteo, but the uh, I don't know what the uh, what the spine surgeons if they would do anything about this particular situation. I'm curious what Michael's uh, observations. About what that was the cause of the fracture? No clear cause. He didn't fall. Or he noticed he wasn't straight one day. There was not a. No, not being facetious, yeah. that's what he says. Like one day, he just kind of looks so, weird. So it's not a pathologic fracture. Presumably, this was a, either an osteoporotic fracture or a fracture, a, a spinal arthritis type fracture. That's the only thing I could do. So, that. exactly. So we sent him to surgery, a surgical evaluation, orthopedics, and they did some more careful imaging. I didn't bring it here, and it looks like it was an, uh, an osteoporotic fracture. And they said there's nothing surgically for them to do right now. What about pamidronate? About what? 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 Pamidronate. Well, no, they did no. initial imaging. I'm not sure. No, 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 no. Using uh, anti, instead of using. So um, bisphosphonate is what she's bringing up. See? Bisphosphonate. Yeah, because, you know, um, Walter Maximovich showed, uh, at least in a, in a small open label study, that uh, pamidronate worked for spondylitis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, for minute race, one, one. What, what, well, you we, can't give it to him right any now. Any other ideas? His structure is acute. You can't give it to him. Amidronate? Oh, my God. Well, I mentioned Forteo earlier, which I would certainly 
So we okay. had a history of, of GERD. I didn't put that on the list. So we had discussions about bisphosphonates, and that didn't, that wasn't really all that uh, feasible for him. Um, so this is sort of what my, my choices for the group are. Um, and I can tell you what we did. We struggled with denosumab because of bone formation. Um, also, the, qu the question of mixing denosumab with uh, used tachinumab in the biologic. Um, and we went ahead with denosumab. Now, the data with denosumab is from Jeff Curtis mixing it, with, combining with other anti TNFs in terms of does it increase the rate of hospitalized infection? And the answer is no. Now, you're going to say, but you weren't using an anti TNF, and that is correct. So you, you go for the closest data that you can get, and that's what we did, and we started him on, uh, on denosumab. So he's on denosumab, he's on ustekinumab. He's still not doing well three months later in terms of his overall uh, uh, axial disease. Um, so what do we do now, 14 months later? Well, what do you mean no response to? Stiffness hasn't changed. Function hasn't changed. Mobility is bad. Um, and he's just miserable, really miserable. I'm not understanding this drug very well. And, and who do I call when I got a problem? I call you. <laughs> I'm calling you. <laughs> Seriously. Because how long does it take to really respond to that drug? You know, it's a slow acting drug, in my opinion. We're all geared to think which about TNFs. Talking I'm talking about Stellara. I used to give you. 14 months. No, it should be. I'd, it should work Michael, I said exactly months. the same thing to him. Wait, be patient. This drug takes time to work. But it clearly at 14 months wasn't. So it's now 14 months. 14 months later, yeah. No, I thought it was. Right. Yeah, 14 months. I waited. I waited and, you know, it said. What were the inflammatory markers at this time? No. Oh, CRP main was, uh, continued to be elevated, as did the SED rate, which is obviously a very bad marker in the absence of, uh, of colonic inflammation on, uh, on colonoscopy. So I would probably go to. Uh, Secukinumab next. And What's that? I'd go to Secukinumab next. Okay. And, uh, There's another question? Great question. So I called the neurologist in Corning and I said, What happened? You know, and uh, she said that uh, as typical diagnosis of optic neuritis, he clearly had monocular visual loss that lasted for several hours, was seen at the time by an ophthalmologist, had a careful exam, and they did not see anything in the eye, and they subsequently did additional studies, and uh, they, could, they were not certain. They thought that uh, this was most consistent with monitor, you know, actually uh, optic neuritis, but there was no clear evidence of that. So I went to him and I said, Maybe we should use an anti-TNF agent with the idea that that may not have been related to multiple sclerosis. Subsequent studies haven't really been revealing. It hasn't been reported. But he absolutely refused. He was not going to take that chance. In, in his view, it wasn't worth doing. So we went to secukinumab. Um, uh, these are the choices, LJANs, you heard about. And um, so we, uh, we used secukinumab. We could not add continuous NSAIDs. You've seen the NSAID data already presented. This is, uh, you've seen the measure two study presented by Philip. And I'm, I'm happy to say that this has been um, six months now, and he's had a dramatic response. He's actually, he's still a little bent over, but um, he's not had any more fractures. He's um, working, feeling comfortable. The pain has dimin uh, dimin diminished dramatically. So what? You were what, able to get that approved. What's that? You were able to get that approved. Well, that was, uh, it was approved when I prescribed it, right? So what did I learn from this case? This case, well, low back pain can escape accurate diagnosis and treatment for a very long time, as we all know. All colitis is not Crohn's disease in a young person. Uh, bad things can happen to good folks. This poor guy's had so many things happen to him. Um, and, and, you know, insurance companies can always make your patient's life and yours worse than you imagine. I didn't tell you the details, but I had multiple interactions with um, people in the insurance company to get meds for him. And that, you know, the, the new treatments are dramatically changing the landscape. So I, I, this has been a long case, I know, but I thought I'd illustrate some of the features we run into in these cases. What's your feeling, Chris, about secukinumab as a better choice just in general than ustekinumab moving forward uh, for, for, AS? For, for AS. And, and you might want to talk a little bit about PSA too. I, I'm, uh, I, I want to get your opinion on this. Yeah, so, so for um, PSA, you know, Michael, it's hard for me to say without a head-to-head -head trial. I don't know. We, we've been using ustekinumab for PSA for a long time because I work with derms and it was approved for psoriasis before it was approved for PSA. I have a long history with that. 
It's like ikinumab. It's also a really great drug. I don't know. Comparatively, it works faster for sure. I mean, that's one thing we have to tell our used to kidney med patients. It's going to take time. We don't mess with 45 nine milligrams if we can. We go right to 90, and we see reasonable responses. Um, and again, earlier with Seki Command, and the second question was in terms of her AS. AS, yeah. Um, we'll have to see, right? We'll have to see what the phase three used to Kinumab data shows, uh, which we're waiting to see and then see how they compare. Again, longer onset, though, it's going to take longer to take effect.